All right, so what I'm going to show you now is how to acquire images with the confocal. I've just left the system, um, having looked at it by eye, and, and I have some cells uh, in focus by eye. Um, so now what I'm going to do is switch to acquisition mode. When I switch to this, the microscope changes from a wide field fluorescence microscope to a laser scanning confocal microscope. So I'll make one note uh, about the, uh, the recording of the screen, which is that you see a few things that are weird like this here, and also the screen seems smaller than it, than it does when you're on the microscope. That's just because the only way I can record this video uh, directly of the screen so you can see all the settings properly is by remoting into the microscope computer from my own computer, which is a little bit uh, complicated and so I'm limited by the, the screen real estate of my laptop. Uh, so it'll look slightly different, but you'll have all the same options. It's just uh, it'll, it'll be bigger when you're actually sitting in front of the microscope. All right, so, so let's get to it. How do, how do we actually take an image with the confocal? The first order of business is we need to tell the microscope what fluorophores we are using. The microscope has no idea what fluorophores we're using, so we need to load a setting with the proper fluorophores. The place where we do that is here by clicking on this button that says Load Acquisition Parameters. If I click there, um, what we need to look for is in this list of parameters, we need to scroll down to the parameters that start with MSL. Those are optimal parameters that we, the staff of the, of the core, have created for different combinations of fluorophores. So we know we have DAPI, Alexa Fluor 488, and Mito Tracker Red. So Mito Tracker Red is actually very similar to Alexa Fluor 594. Um, so that's what I'm going to look for in this list. So I'm going to look for something that says MSL, DAPI, Alexa Fluor 488, and either Mito Tracker if we have it, let's see if we do, or Alexa Fluor 594. So you can see here that there are many, many different settings that have those combinations. So there's MSL, DAPI, AF 488, AF 594, 1 by 2 line, 1 by 2 frame, 2 by 1 frame, 2 by 1 line. So the one you're looking for is the one called multi. So this is the one that we're looking for. And the reason is that is the one that more optimally reduces the possibility of crosstalk between the channels. So if you're imaging one, uh, it will reject most of the light from the others. So that's the one that we're going to select. If you have any questions about what the proper setting is to select, or if you don't see a setting that is appropriate for what you want to do, um, please contact the staff and we'll set something up for you. Uh, also note that uh, these settings are one of the main differences between uh, the, the, the LSM 710 and the 700. The LSM 710 has more detectors, uh, so it can more easily look at uh, multiple fluorophores uh, more quickly. In any case, this video is uh, showing you uh, things on the LSM 700, so um, this is what we're doing. I will select MSL DAPI 488594 multi. Okay, so that populated a number of things here. Uh, all of this refers to how the image is going to acquire. You don't need to touch really anything here. Um, so uh, that said, I'll just show you the way the microscope is going to do things. It's going to first image the 594, then the 488, then the DAPI. The way it's going to do that is first it's going to illuminate the, the, the sample uh, with laser light that uh, has a wavelength of 555, and then it's going to collect the resulting fluorescence uh, from the Alexa Fluor 594 with a long pass 560 nanometer filter. Uh, it's going to do that for the entire image, then it's going to switch to the Alexa 488 setting where it's going to illuminate the sample with a 48 nanometer laser and collect the light uh, that results from the emission in the 490 to 555 range. Uh, it's going to do that for the entire image, and then it's going to switch to DAPI and that is going to be collected by illuminating the sample with 405 nanometer light and collecting the resulting fluorescence from a range that goes up to 490 nanometers, okay? Uh, you really don't need to worry about the details of that too much, um, but I just thought I'd, I'd sort of briefly explain what it is that it's doing. Okay, so we have the settings. What next? All right, so um, what next is uh, the pinhole size and just, just if you forget or if you don't have access to this video so easily, let me remind you that if you go to the desktop of, of this computer, 
you will see here that I am basically going to follow this workflow um, to set up my imaging. So the first thing we did was load imaging settings from MSL list or a previous image. Um, now we're going to set the pinhole. So with respect to the previous image, um, you you can load your settings from an image that you have already taken. Uh, since I have not actually taken an image of this yet, uh, I can't show you that. I'll show you that later, uh, which is typically the more practical way of loading the settings. Uh, but since we didn't have that option, that's why I loaded them from the default list. So let's talk about how to set the pinhole size. So you set that in this channels submenu. The pinhole size is here. So this is a slider that if you move it, it will change this number, this number, and this number. So what are these numbers? So this is the size of the pinhole uh, in physical units, so in microns. This is the size of the pinhole in airy units. And this is the resulting thickness of the optical section from setting the pinhole there. Uh, I have a talk where I discuss the principles of confocal and what this pinhole means. What you need to know is this pinhole controls the optical sectioning, so rejection of out-of-focus light such that you are cutting the sample in 3D. And so we need to set this correctly. And so if we set it too high, uh, we'll get a lot of light, but we, we, our, our images will look sort of blurry. If we set it too low, uh, we'll get crisp images, but uh, if we set it too low, um, they, they won't have enough light to really do anything with them. So there, there's an optimal, and the optimal setting for the pinhole is to go to your longest wavelength die. In this case, that's Alexafluor 594. Grab this slider and make it so that it is at one area unit. So luckily, you know, you could do that by moving the slider around and trying to get it right to one. The easiest way to do it is because this is such a typical setting, you need to press this button here that says one AU and the software will automatically find the diameter such that the pinhole size in these normalized units is one, okay? Once you have that set for your longest wavelength die, you need to check that this, the value, the actual size of the pinhole, the physical dimensions of the pinhole are the same in the other channels, even if the area units are not the same. So let's, let's check that. So in the 594, it's 35.5. I'm going to copy that number. So I just did control C. Uh, let's go to 48. So in 48, you see it's different, but we need it to be the same. So I'm just going to paste. So with control V, 35.5, and the same is going to be true in DAPI. Okay. So this is another difference with the 710. On the 710 uh, microscope, uh, these values are chained together in many of the settings uh, for reasons that don't matter right now. Just believe me that that's true. Um, so you you can check it, but they'll be the same in most uh, settings, certainly in all three channel settings. Okay, so the pinhole is set correctly. What next? So if you look here, we need to focus on something bright, um, find the brightest Z plane of the object, put the confocal, and then you start mucking around with the setting. So I'm basically gonna do all of these things step by step. So I, I've already focused on something bright. Um, and uh, particularly in the red channel. So I'm, I'm going to do this one channel at a time. I'm going to unclick the 488 and the DAPI. And to get an image, I'm going to click on Live. So now you can see there's something here. We don't actually see much, and that's for several reasons. First, we might not be in focus. Second, perhaps, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have the cell in the middle. Uh, more importantly, uh, these default settings, they have a very uh, sort of a, a low-ish gain at 500 and a low laser power at 2%. Uh, but also, um, the way the image is displayed is on a red scale. Um, so things that are dark are black and things that are bright are red. And that really isn't a very useful scale when one is trying to set up uh, imaging conditions. So what I recommend is you go to Dimensions and you click here where it says Range Indicator. So this range indicator scale is a much more useful scale uh, with which to make adjustments. And the reason it's useful is because pixels that are too dark are blue. So those are pixels that are at zero. So there's sort of no detectable signal coming from them or very, very close to zero. Pixels that are too bright are red. Those are pixels that are at the maximum detection level uh, of the system. Uh, so we definitely don't want any of those. Luckily, it doesn't seem like we have any of those. And then everything in the middle is on a gray scale that goes from black to gray to white. 
And so this display scale immediately highlights pixels that we don't want, blue and red, and it shows us the middle uh, pixels, uh, so the, the pixels with medium intensities on a grayscale. And a grayscale is great because it's very easy to see by eye. Okay, so let me adjust settings here. Whoops, I, I, the reason that moved is I bumped the joystick. So the first thing I'm going to do, uh, so clearly there's some stuff here that looks like a cell, so maybe it is this, is I'm going to move the focus. I'm moving the focus knob manually, just my hand, uh, to try and get to the Z plane where things look the brightest. And so that right there looks like a good spot to camp out. Uh, once I have, uh, once I'm in, a, in the Z plane that's brightest, what I can do is I don't want any of these blue pixels because these blue pixels mean I could lose signal there just because uh, uh, the levels are too low for the detector. So I'm going to increase the digital offset one unit at a time until I get rid of all the blue pixels in the image. Okay, so now I don't have any blue pixels, so um, that's great. Um, the next thing I need to do is adjust the gain and laser power to get an image that has a good brightness, good signal to noise, and uh, that isn't bleaching. So that's what we're going to um, discuss next in detail. But before we do that, uh, let me point out something important, which is when you are making these adjustments, it's very important to make them on a sample that is on the brighter side of the things that you care about. The idea being the following, you don't want to saturate any of your images. So you don't want any of your images to have pixels that are the brightest that they could possibly be. Because if you have that, then that will distort the morphology and it won't allow you to make any kind of quantitative comparisons or really even qualitative comparisons. So and in addition, it's irreversible if you make that mistake. Uh, so the only solution is to go back and re-image. So you definitely don't want to make that mistake. And the way you avoid it is you set things up with something really bright, something really bright that you care about. Um, you, you don't need to sort of focus on something really bright that you're not going to image anyway, but something bright that you care about. Uh, and the idea is if, if that if that image of something bright is properly set up, then all the other images of sort of dimmer things will be just fine, okay? So let's talk about um, how we adjust our settings to get a high quality image. So we're gonna start by adjusting two things, the gain and the laser power. So the gain refers to the voltage on the photomultiplier tube that detects the light. So uh, I have a discussion of what that means in a little bit more detail in my confocal lecture. I encourage you to look at that um, to understand what that means. And this slider controls the intensity of the laser. That's fairly straightforward, like how bright is the light that's hitting the sample. Okay, and so what, what happens if we increase either of these? So if we increase the gain, the image gets brighter, and eventually it gets so bright that there are a bunch of pixels that are saturated, so you can see them in red. So we definitely don't want that. Now, what happens if we increase the laser power? If we increase the laser power, again, the image gets brighter, and eventually there's saturation. So this brings up two kind of very important questions. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Okay. And so those two important questions are, how should I set these? So how bright should the image be? So clearly I don't want red, but where should I set it? Should I set it so that the image is this bright, it's this bright, it's this bright? So that's one question, it's just how bright should the image be? And then the other question is, how do I balance laser power and gain? So if I have the option of using both, how do I decide which combination of these makes the most sense, okay? So to figure that out, uh, we are going to use something called the histogram mode. So I'm gonna bring this back up, go to histogram. Uh, actually, to make the real estate a little bit smaller, there we go. All right, so what is this? So here's the image. Here are some statistics on the image. And then this is a histogram of all the pixel values in the image. So, so let me kind of show you what that means in a little bit more detail. All right, so, so if I look at this image and zoom all the way in, you can see that the image 
is a bunch of little pixels, okay? Where if that pixel corresponds to a physical location in the sample that was very bright, that pixel uh, that, that, that had a lot of fluorophore, excuse me, that pixel will be very bright. If it corresponds to a location where there wasn't much fluorophore, that pixel will be very dim. In fact, uh, pixels all have numbers associated with them that tell you how bright uh, that, that location was. So, how, you know, how many photons were emitted from the fluorophores in that location? And you can see that if you hover over a pixel uh, and you look down here, um, so I can't point uh, at two things at once, so I'm just going to hover on a pixel and then you just look here and you'll see what happens. You can see uh, um, it says intensity, there are two numbers in parentheses and it says channel 2, 2, 7, 4, 7. So the two numbers in parentheses are the x, y coordinates of that location. And the number that says channel 22747, that 2747 is the intensity of the light that came from the location in the sample represented by that pixel on a scale that goes from 0 to 4095. Okay? Um, so every single location in the sample, every single pixel in the sample, has a number associated with it. So those numbers are really high here because there was a lot of floor for, but if I go somewhere like here, those numbers are very low. Um, if I look at all of those numbers and I make a histogram of them, so all of the numbers from all the locations, I make a histogram, I see this. So this is not a very interesting histogram because it has a humongous peak near zero because most of the pixels are dark, and then it has the long, a long tail. So this by itself, uh, and again, we're on histogram mode, this is not that useful. But if I then make a little rectangle here and draw it on the brightest thing in this field of view, which is probably that blob right there, now I have a representation of a hist so a histogram of the pixels inside that small area. And so this is much more useful because I don't want uh, anything in this image, which is all interesting to me, to be saturated. Uh, and here I have a, a, a sort of a readout of what the pixel values actually are in the brightest thing in the image. So let's use this to our advantage to set things up. So I'm going to go back to live. When you go to live, unfortunately, uh, you have to click on range indicator again. It's sort of that, that setting doesn't persist. The software doesn't remember. And you also have to redraw any areas that you made. So that's a little bit annoying, but I'm going to do it right here. All right. Um, so this is clearly too bright. So what do I do? So I can either reduce the laser power or reduce the gain. So let's reduce the laser power a little bit and then reduce the gain a little bit and discuss the first question that we had, which is whatever the combination of you know, two things that I do here is, what should I shoot for in terms of intensities? And so what we recommend in the microscopy services lab is that you set these up such that the intensity of the brightest pixels in the brightest thing in your sample are somewhere between 2000 and 2500. So we are focused on the brightest thing in our sample there. It's that little blob that was quite bright. And I'm gonna adjust the gain first to try and get the brightest pixels in that blob somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500. So the idea for this recommendation is the following. You could technically have it here, uh, not there, excuse me. Let me set it just by typing. It's going to be easier. You could have something like this where the brightest pixels are not saturated. They're near 4,000, and that would you know, technically be fine. The problem with doing this is that if you have something brighter somewhere else, uh, it will saturate your image. So you want to leave yourself a safety margin uh, because of the perils of saturation and, and that it would force you to reacquire your images. So I'm going to reduce this from 580 to 560. And maybe I should reduce it even more to 550. So here we have the brightest pixels kind of hovering between 2000 and 2500. I'm just going to give myself a bit more of a safety margin by just moving it to 540. And so this basically gives us uh, a buffer in case this isn't actually the brightest thing in the samples that we'll be interested in. We find something brighter. We, we, we can have something that's almost 50% or 75% brighter, and we will still not be saturated. So that's the idea for shooting for this. So the next question is, OK, um, we have the, the brightness that we want. How do we balance gain and laser power to get a high quality image? So um, the issue here to keep in mind is the following. If you have an image that has very low laser power and high gain, 
it will be noisier than an image where the, the inverse is true. You have high laser power and low gate. So let me show you that in an example. So if I go uh, here, so let me see. Let me reduce this to something like 0.3. Okay, so that, that's, that's very low intensity. So now to compensate, I'm going to increase my gain until the intensity is roughly the same. So you can see that the intensity is roughly the same. Uh, let me reduce it even further here. Okay. Okay, that's as low as she goes. Okay, so. So note the graininess here, okay? With a laser power of 0.2 and a gain of 745. The intensity is about where we want it, but the image looks quite noisy. So what can we do uh, instead? So what we can do instead is we can lower the gain and increase the laser power. And you can see that this image, which has a very similar intensity as before, it's much cleaner, it's not as noisy. And so this is a general principle. The higher your laser power and the lower your gain, um, the image will have higher quality. So you can play around with different settings, always aiming for an intensity of around 2000 and sort of see what the minimal laser power that gets you the quality that you need is. You don't wanna go overboard because um, of the risk of bleaching. So how do you evaluate bleaching? So bleaching means the irreversible destruction of the fluorophore as you illuminate it. So the way you can tell if it's bleaching is if you are looking at it and it's fading, it's, it's actually bleaching a lot. Uh, if you're looking at it and this is sort of shifting to the left, that means it's bleaching a lot. <clears throat> the other way to keep track is if you look at this mean intensity here, if it is bleaching over time, these numbers will get lower and lower. And so that doesn't really seem to be happening to any significant extent. Now we're oscillating between 360 and 370, it seems. So these are settings that give us Quite, quite reasonable quality, uh, but no bleaching. Um, so this, these would be good settings. We can, we can try for more quality. So for example, if we look at a different part of the sample, so if we think that this is still too noisy, we can try and reduce the gain even further. Um, so now it's at around 1,000. So if I double the laser power, I should get to around here. I was before. And so that's true. And so you can see that now this looks a little bit cleaner. And the bleaching we can check doesn't really seem to have gone up significantly. So again, you can play this game as much as you want. There's no hard limit on how high you can go on the laser power. Now, obviously, if you set it to 100%, you're going to burn a hole through it. Um, but that's not what we're talking about right now. This is another difference with the LSM 710, where uh, the LSM 710, a few of its lasers are very weak. Uh, particularly the 543 nanometer laser and the 594. So for those lasers on that system, uh, it is the case that you can go up to 100 without really much consequence. And you may need to go up to 100 to get uh, appropriate signal to noise. Okay. So if we look at our sort of checklist here, we've talked about how we use the digital offset and how we balance laser power and gain for brightness, quality, and bleaching. So let's go back here. Uh, and let's discuss other ways in which we can affect um, the contrast of the image. So I've already shown you one way, which is to balance the laser power and the gain. Um, if you increase the laser power and lower the gain, you get higher quality. It does not cost you anything in time. It's not slower to do that, but it has a cost in bleaching. If you illuminate with higher laser power, you will eventually bleach more. So what are other ways of... Uh, changing the quality of the image. So to address these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower this to 0.2 um, and go up in gain until we're at about the same intensity as we were before, just to sort of show you the effect of, of averaging. So you can see we're back to quite a noisy image here. Um, there are two other things that you can do to increase the quality of the image. And those are averaging, or adjusting the speed. The preference is to increase quality by using averaging as opposed to increasing it by using uh, 
reducing the speed, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll deal with those in a second. So what is what, what are these, these options? So let's start with averaging. So what is averaging? So I'm going to go back to 2D, and I'm going to uh, fit this to the screen, do the following. And so uh, this is just so we can see it a little bit better. Um, so what happens when you average? So let's actually stop the live imaging and actually snap an image. So once I've snapped that image, uh, let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to save this image in computer, data, user images. I'm going to create a file for myself, a uh, folder for myself. And I'm going to save it in the CZI format. You can use LSM2, but CZI is preferable. It, it's a, uh, it works a little bit better with the newer versions of the software. And I'm going to call this average one. Uh, and I'm going to take a series of images with different averaging and show you the results to illustrate some of the, uh, the characteristics of averaging. So that was with an averaging of two. Take an image with an average of four. So what's happening when I take images with a different amount of averaging is that what the, what the software tells the microscope to do is to take the image multiple times and then average the results together. Uh, so that obviously takes longer uh, because we're taking multiple images. It also bleaches the sample more because we're illuminating it more times. Uh, but the reason we're doing it uh, is because the more you average the images, the better the quality. So the more images we average, the quality, the resulting quality will be better. But um, there's a few sort of twists to this that you should keep in mind, which is the more you average, the better it gets, but by a smaller and smaller amount. So there are sort of diminishing returns to doing this. Uh, it's not linear. It's not that if you average 16 times, it's 16 times better than if you don't average. So keep that in mind, uh, sort of diminishing returns. And the other uh, thing that you should keep in mind is things that are very noisy improve a lot with averaging, whereas things that are not that noisy don't improve much. So how much averaging you should do uh, really has to do with um, you know, what you need in terms of quality uh, to be able to uh, do the analysis that you want, uh, but, but also sort of what your sample looks like in the first place, because some samples, if they already look very good, averaging isn't really going to improve them much, whereas others, if they, they're quite noisy, averaging, averaging can have a really uh, great effect. So to show you the effect of averaging, what I'm going to do is uh, set all these to range indicators just a little bit easier to show you things. If I do that. And I'm going to set them all to kind of the same zoom so we can see this structure, which is a nice structure that's kind of noisy. All right. And then the final thing I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to click on show all here. Uh, this will show me a bunch of extra parameters, and I'm going to use those to adjust this, which is just a manual adjustment of the contrast of the image. Adjusting this does not change the data. It just changes how it looks. And the reason I'm doing it is I want this to look a little bit brighter, uh, just so we can compare things more accurately. And the reason I'm doing show all is that the, the parameters of the adjustment I made are here. And so what I want is to be able to copy these parameters and sort of compare all of them identically. So let me do that. Again, these adjustments don't change the data, they just change how it looks. And I'm just doing them so we can see a little bit more clearly uh, what might be going on here with the averaging. Note something important, which is now we have saturated pixels here. Those are dis saturated in the display. They're not actual saturated data, which you can tell if I hover here uh, and you look at the pixel values down there, you'll see that they're around uh, 1200, uh, they're clearly not saturated. It's just an, uh, it just means that, uh, you know, the, the display is saturated. And in fact, if I did this, you can see that it looks saturated, but it, it's really not. The data hasn't changed. Um, so make sure that when you're setting things up, you actually haven't messed with this. This is just something that we're doing so we can check what, what averaging, uh, the effects of averaging on this sort of noisy structure. So this is an average of one, so basically no averaging. 
is an average of two. That's a, that's a significant improvement. An average of four, it's still improved. An average of eight, the improvement is much more subtle. So here's four, here's eight. And from eight, we go to 16, and the improvement is really hard to see. So, so this shows you how um, the more you average, the better it gets, but by a smaller and smaller amount. The other thing is if you can compare the improvement here to the improvement in something like this, it's much more noticeable here. So again, if you go to average one, you, you average twice, and both improved. You average four times, and both improved. You average eight times, and so this, there's a slight improvement here. It's much harder to see. So from here to here, I would argue that it's harder to see the improvement in quality compared to here to there, and particularly in these uh, dim things. So again, the more you average, the better it gets, but by a smaller and smaller amount. And things that are very noisy, uh, the averaging has a very clear effect on things that are already quite good uh, in terms of signal uh, contrast, uh, the, the averaging really doesn't have uh, that much of an effect. So how, how much should you average? Well, again, th there is no rule. Uh, there is no, oh, you should always average uh, two or four times. It, it just depends on what you need for your subsequent analysis, okay? Uh, there are costs to averaging in time uh, and in bleaching. So, so that might raise the question of why would I average at all if I can accomplish the same by increasing the laser power and lowering the gain. So remember, that is a way of increasing quality. It costs you bleaching, but does not cost you time. Whereas averaging is a way of increasing quality that costs you both bleaching and time. And so the reason for why you might want to do averaging instead of this is, is uh, that there's sort of two big reasons. One is that while both of them increase the quality and both of them cost you bleaching, the bleaching costs for increasing the laser and lowering the gain are much higher than for averaging. So even with the same total amount of light, delivering it all at once in a powerful blast by increasing the laser power is more harmful to the fluorophores in the sample than having much, le uh, much less laser power and uh, hitting the sample repeatedly with it. Even though, even if you have the same sort of total amount of light that hits the sample, this averaging is a more gentle way of delivering it. So if you're worried about bleaching, averaging can be um, uh, a, a good approach to increasing quality. Uh, the other uh, reason that, that it, averaging can be a, a good approach is sort of more applicable usually to the LSM 710, and it's that sometimes you don't have enough laser power to get the quality you need, and so you don't have a choice. You can't really increase the laser power much further, uh, and so you, you have to use uh, averaging. All right, get that out of the way. All right, so the other option is speed. That's This is another option to increase quality. So if you reduce the speed, it will be slower, it will bleach more, and it'll improve the quality. Now, the reason I usually don't recommend speed uh, to people is because for the same investment in time as averaging, so for example, if you reduce the speed such that it takes twice as long to take an image, um, that is gives you an equivalent increase in quality to an averaging of two. So, you know, it costs you the same time, gives you about the same increase in quality, uh, but the problem is that reducing the speed costs you more in bleaching than in increasing the averaging. So it's sort of a bad deal uh, because you get the same increase in quality as averaging, but at a higher cost in bleaching. And so really speed I leave as a last ditch effort. Uh, if I'm maxed out on averaging, if I can't really do much with the laser, then I start mucking around with speed. Uh, the other reason you may want to muck around with speed is you can make slightly more subtle adjustments. So averaging on the Zeiss confocals, it always goes by factors of two, and maybe you don't want to jump from eight to 16, you just want a little bit more quality. And it turns out the speed, you have the ability to make those sort of more subtle modifications. You can see uh, there's two ways that speed is expressed. One is as pixel dwell time. So that's how long the laser spends on each of the sort of 250,000-ish pixels in this image. And then the scan time, uh, in this case, is about 15 seconds. So if you reduce it from the setting called 9 to the setting called 8, those are sort of arbitrary. You can see that it went, uh, it didn't really double. Uh, it went to something kind of in the middle. And so, so you can have slightly more subtle adjustments. Okay, um, so that's uh, speed. So I, I had to take a brief pause in the video, but let's let's sum up a little bit of, of what we've done so far. So I've shown you uh, different ways of improving the contrast in the image. First, balancing laser power and gain. Second, using averaging. 
Third, we mentioned the effects of speed, and I've recommended that you really don't use that. And so how do you how do you make final decisions? Well, the way, again, you make final decisions based on the signal to noise that you need in your image to do your analysis. Uh, but one, one thing that, that you have to also keep in mind with one of these parameters in particular, uh, or, or actually with two, with speed and averaging, is that speed and averaging apply across all channels. So you have to make decisions about them based on all channels. And so far, we've only adjusted the red channel. So let's adjust the other ones and see uh, what, what we come up with in the end for this image, okay? So uh, let me unclick the red, click on the, the green, click here. So clicking the gray controls what settings are shown here. The checkboxes controls what, what the microscope is actually gonna do. So now I have the green clicked, so those are the settings that I can control, and the checkbox marked. So when I hit five, I will actually see the green image. So again, to set this up, I want to go to Range Indicator. I want to go to the brightest uh, object and the brightest Z-plane. So I'm going to move down. These things look brighter than the rest. I'm moving across the sample with the joystick, which you obviously can't see because I'm just recording the screen. I'm going to move in Z by moving the focus knob up and down. And so that seems, so the brightest thing here seems maybe to be that or even this. So now uh, the next step is I need to increase the digital offset until all the blue pixels are gone. Okay. Uh, and now I want to go to histogram, draw a little box here. Some of these pixels that are really bright. And in fact, because they're, they're a little bit crooked, let me see if I can make a better thing here. Yeah. It's not super great, but hopefully that captures more of what I'm interested in. OK, so you can see here are the brightest pixels and the brightest object. Um, <clears throat> so now, let me click here just so we can see it a little bit better on my screen. Does not seem to want to, okay. There we go. All right, so you can see the image a little bit better, and you can see the histogram here. Um, so we need to adjust this channel. So this actually looks pretty good, but let's see. Let's try if we go down to, let's say, a 0.5 laser power. Uh, obviously, it's dimmer, so let's increase the gain until we reach uh, between 2000 and 2500. I took it to 650, which was overkill. Let me go down to 600. So that's more where we want to be. And you can see the signal here still looks pretty darn good. Um, now, if I took it even further down, you'd see that now it looks actually quite noisy. Um, so let's say we liked where we were at 0.5. And if we set the gain to 600, we're roughly our sort of brightest pixels are around 2,000 or 2,500. I can increase it probably a little bit, 610. And so this is you know, uh, a pretty good image um, for the 488. So now let's look at Daffy. So again, we go to live, click here, set the range indicator. Uh, this clicking to make this go down and up, uh, you really don't need to do that on the microscope itself. I'm just doing it here because uh, my sort of screen real estate is very limited and I want you to be able to see this clearly. Okay, so first order of business again, increase the digital offset till the blue pixels are gone. Uh, then we can draw a little box on the things that we care about. So the brightest one seems to be this. So you can see that the pixel values uh, are a little bit lower than what we would want. So we can increase the gain until we get exactly what we want. And then we can start messing around once we have the, the intensity roughly where we want. We can start messing around with the laser power. So this actually looks very clean. 
So I could probably reduce the laser power significantly and still get a pretty good image. So if I go to 0.5 and I increase this, let's say to 650, um, let's go to 700. Okay, that seems actually still very low. So let's increase the laser power a little bit. Okay, so you can see these are sort of much noisier nuclei. But with the DAPI, you have to think of, of the following. You typically just want um, to know where the nuclei are. You don't need much detail in them. So it's it's not a very good idea to, to have a great image of, uh, of the DAPI nuclei if you don't need them, because the DAPI nuclei are imaged with a 4 or 5 nanometer laser, and that laser will damage things that are not the not, not just the DAPI floor floor. So if you're going to err on the side of caution, uh, do it in, in, in this channel in particular, because this will not just bleach um, the DAPI, it will bleach other fluorophores. Um, the lasers are pretty low, so here um, you can check the, uh, the, the bleaching, and you can see that not, not much seems to be going on. The signal is appropriate, so I'm happy with this channel. I forgot to check the bleaching on the 488, so let's do a quick check of that. I don't think it'll be significant, but let's just be thorough. So let's draw a box somewhere bright. Just draw a box here, actually. And so if we look at the mean intensity, you know, nothing much seems to be changing. So I'm going to say that those settings look pretty good. So now to snap an image of all three channels at once, we click on all three and then we hit snap. And you can see how you acquire an image first in one channel, and in the other channel, then in the other one. And these images had an averaging of four. And so you can decide uh, whether that's warranted uh, by, again, checking, changing the averaging, taking a snapshot and seeing whether it was worth it or not. You can see that we paid a big price, so it takes almost 12 seconds to take an image with an averaging of four. Uh, and that might be more than we want to wait. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's where you know, the, the, the trial and error comes in. You just have to try things, see what you get, see whether that would be enough for the analysis, and keep going from there. Um, one other thing to note is that this may look dim to you. Uh, don't worry about that. This is a properly balanced image with no saturated pixels, kind of good contrast. Uh, not no significant bleaching. And so later, by adjusting these things, you can make things look brighter or dimmer to emphasize different aspects of the image. But this does not saturate the image. This doesn't change the data. And as long as you make the same changes in images that you're going to compare, you're fine. If you try and make it the image brighter by adjusting things here, you will almost certainly lead to saturated pixels, and then you won't actually be able to do any kind of real comparisons with your data sets, okay? So don't worry if it looks um, a little bit dim. <clears throat> the, fi the final thing that I, that I want to discuss, at least with these sort of low uh, mag images at 20x, is the level of detail. So if you zoom in, you can see that the level of detail we're getting is limited. So these are presumably actin fibers, and you can see that they're quite chunky, and that's because the size of the pixel relative to the size of the structures we care about is actually quite large. And you can see that here, the pixel size is 0.63 microns. Uh, so that may be a, a little bit on the big side for the things that we're looking at. If it's not, that's fine. Uh, but if it is, so what are your options? So with the 20x, uh, if you want to stay with that objective because you want to get a big field of view and you're really just interested in cellular details with maybe a, a few subcellular highlights, uh, one, one easy option you can do is if you go here, you can increase uh, the frame size to 1024 by 1024. That doubles the number of pictures, pi pixels excuse me, in the X and Y dimensions. And so if you snap an image uh, with that, and I'm just going to max out the speed again, because when you change this, the speed changes in, in sometimes strange ways. Um, so I'm just going to max this out uh, and snap an image. But when you do that, what you'll see is the pixels are smaller, so you'll get more detail in your images. So let's let that play out. That's the red channel. Here's the green channel. The green channel, I think, is going to be the most informative in terms of how much more detail we get because it has those fine features uh, from the actin. So if we zoom in, you can see now that this is a very different story. So if I compare that to 
Okay, let's make the comparison explicitly, actually. Uh, so how much averaging did I have? I had four averaging. I'll call this 1024 by 1024. 1024, <clears throat> excuse me. So if I compare this to uh, one where I do the same thing, but I do 512 by 512, snap an image. Let's take a look and see what comes out so you can see the effect of having the smaller pixels. So you can see here the difference. Uh, don't worry about the difference in brightness. Just pay attention to the difference in chunkiness. And you can see very clearly uh, that if you have these smaller pixels, um, you can see these details much more clearly. Now, if you were studying nuclei, this is overkill. But if you were studying these fibers, uh, you know, to a certain extent, this would be a, a, a better choice. Now, if you really need subcellular detail, you shouldn't be using a 20x objective. You should be using on the LSM 700, you should be using the 63x oil objective uh, because that objective is uh, is the one that has the highest resolution. It has the highest numerical aperture, uh, which is a characteristic of the objective that determines the resolution. And it is also uh, the objective on the system that's better corrected for imaging different um, fluorophores. So that's, that's your best option if you need subcellular details on the LSM 700. On the 710, you should be considering either the 63x oil objective or the 40x oil. And the difference there is in their working distance and brightness. The 40x uh, has a shorter working distance, so it can't see as far into a sample, but it, it's brighter. Uh, the 63x, it's the opposite. It can see deeper into a sample, but it, it, it's not as bright. They both have the same resolution, which on a confocal doesn't depend on the magnification. It's exclusively determined by the numerical aperture. So um, what we'll do next uh, is I will show you how to put oil uh, on the 63x oil objective, and I'll show you how to optimize your settings uh, using the same sample, uh, but really diving into how to set the pixel value uh, correctly uh, to get the highest subcellular detail possible.